Kemalodnam had been the capital city of a Celtic tribe, the Trinovantes. But in 8043, the Roman conquerors had come ironclad and ruthless. Homes were seized, farms taken, men, women, and children driven off their ancestral lands or sold into slavery or slain. The city was to be set aside for the retiring soldiers of the empire. An imposing stone temple was built to Emperor Claudius, lately conqueror of Britain, and now, after his death, deified and depicted in a life-size bronze statue. But for good measure, the new Roman masters erected another statue outside the temple so that the vanquished Celts, as they gazed up into the triumphant face of the goddess Victory, would know they were beaten. And so the retired Roman soldiers settled down in the Celtic city for the good life, taking from the native populace whatever caught their eye, be it food, animal, young woman. No one guessed that in a few short years they would see smoke on the horizon and the dust of an approaching army, that the statue of the goddess Victory would lie toppled face down in the dirt while flames leapt up all around, that they would flee into the temple where the idol of Claudius would look on in mute impotence as the doors were battered down. No one imagined that Boudicca, queen of the Celts, was coming. I'm Charity Mainwaring and welcome to Strong Stories. This channel is all about the lives of brave women who changed the course of history. If you like what you're hearing and you want to hear more stories of their remarkable lives, be sure to hit the subscribe button. To the Roman eye, Boudicca was very tall, an appearance most terrifying. In the glance of her eye, most fierce, and her voice was harsh. Fiery red hair fell to her hips, partially covering a broad golden torque which always graced her neck. Over a bright dress, she draped a rich mantle fastened with a brooch. Cassius Dio, a Roman historian who appears to have been quite taken with the warrior queen, adds that she liked to appear in public grasping a spear, terrifying all who saw her. If her gaze was fierce and her countenance spine-chilling to her imperial enemies, the Romans had only themselves to blame. Boudicca and her people had been so mistreated under occupation that no one could blame her if she'd been driven thoroughly mad through suffering. As is so often the case, the yoke of the conqueror had, at first, been light and easy, the weight only becoming unbearable over time. When Emperor Claudius' legions had first leapt from the galleys in AD 43, Boudicca's husband, Pursutigus, had seen which way the wind was blowing. King of the Iceni Celts of southeast Britain, Pursutigus had allied his tribe with the empire, hoping for preferential treatment. At the outset, his scheme seemed to work, as his people were left in relative peace, while elsewhere on the island, the Roman fist crushed those who resisted. Hoping the arrangement could continue after his death around AD 60, the king left his lands both to Emperor Nero and his own two daughters. But Nero's treasury officer, Catus Decianus, aware that the emperor was hardly interested in sharing conquered lands with the locals, sent in his troops to take everything. Queen Boudicca, the leadership of her tribe, suddenly thrust upon her, and the earth, still fresh over her husband's burial mound, was now confronted with Roman soldiers at her front door, demanding all her land and property. But this was just the beginning of Roman greed. A scheme planted in Rome to profit off the unsuspecting Celts now yielded its poisoned fruit. Seneca, tutor and advisor to Nero, had forced huge loans on the Britons at oppressive interest rates. Emperor Claudius had bought the loyalty of Celtic nobles, such as Boudicca's husband, with generous piles of coin. However, now Nero's treasury officer, Decianus, wanted it all back with interest. Another Roman historian, Tacitus, blames Decianus' greed for what followed after. Using their loans as a pretext, Roman soldiers poured into Iceni lands and that of the surrounding tribes, stripping every one of their property, turning them out of their homes, and having their way with anyone who resisted. Tacitus tells us that Boudicca's entire realm was pillaged, her relatives enslaved, and her own household was treated as a prize of war. Hardly deaf to the cries of her people, the queen protested this treatment to Decianus' men. Their response? String her up and subject her to the scourge, a Roman cat of nine tails with spiked barbs so damaging to the flesh that receiving only a few blows often led to death or insanity. 
For good measure, Boudicca's daughters were raped right before her very eyes. History has not recorded what passed in Boudicca's heart as she and her daughters healed in the coming weeks, nor with whom they stayed as their own home was taken. We can only imagine how Boudicca's grief over her violated daughters hardened into an iron will to fight even the invincible armies of Rome in a desperate bid for justice. We do know that the Iceni queen not only retained leadership of her own tribe, but won the support of the neighboring Trinovantes in a bold plan to cast off the shackles of Nero or die trying. Tacitus' account of Boudicca's message to the Celtic tribes is apocryphal, but it nevertheless captures the spirit of what the warrior queen's example has meant to the world. He records that Boudicca, mounted in a chariot with her daughters before her, rode before the assembled clans and spoke these words. It is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters. Roman lust has gone so far that not our very persons, not even age or youth, are left unpolluted. But heaven is on the side of a righteous vengeance. This is a woman's resolve. Nearby stood the most important Roman city in Britain at the time, Camelodunum, modern-day Colchester. The soldiers and veterans who lived there had enthusiastically participated in the rape and pillage of Celtic lands. Too late did they realize the wrath they had stirred up against themselves. When word reached the city that an army of 100,000 Celts was approaching, the real number was probably around 50,000, the citizens of Camelodunum rushed word to Treasury Officer Catus Decianus to send troops at once. But Nero's armies were spread throughout the island, and Decianus' chief concern had been pillaging the countryside. As a result, he was only able to muster 200 ill-equipped men to defend the city. In a matter of just hours, Boudicca, whose name incidentally means victory, stood in triumph over the cast-down statue of the Roman goddess of the same name, while flames crackled and spread all around her. Every Roman in Camelodunum was mercilessly slaughtered. With great labor, every Roman structure was cast down, stone by sooty stone and brick by blackened brick. Archaeologists have found a thick layer of ash throughout Colchester, which can be viewed to this day, calling it the Boudican Destruction Layer. It was as if Boudicca was trying to erase even the memory of the hated empire from her homeland. In 1907, the bronze head of the statue of the emperor was found in the river Ald not far away. It had been deliberately severed at the neck. Meanwhile, the 9th Legion, led by Quintus Cariolus, had rushed south to intercept the Celtic horde before they reached Camelodunum. Arriving too late, Cariolus found Boudicca's troops ready and waiting. Given what we know of the outcome, it appears the Iceni Queen arranged a successful ambush of the hard-marching force. To his intense relief, Cariolus and his cavalry made a hair-raising last-second escape on horseback, abandoning his foot soldiers to their fate. The 9th Legion's infantry, some 2,000 Roman soldiers, was wiped out to a man. Boudicca took no prisoners. When word of these disasters reached Londinium, modern-day London, the slippery Decianus decided enough was enough and fled for his life, absconding across the Channel to Gaul and ending his career in disgrace. However, Nero had another, more formidable agent on the island, Governor Gaius Suetonius Paulinus. He had marched the main body of Rome's troops in Britain to Wales to crush a Druidic rebellion. His feeling of elation at successfully wiping out the Druidic priests and their followers turned to alarm when news reached him of Boudicca's revolt far to the southeast. At once, he understood that the empire's very hold on Britain was at stake. Indeed, when Emperor Nero heard the news of the fate of Camelodunum and his Ninth Legion, he considered abandoning the province before further disaster struck in the shape of a wild-eyed redhead with a bone to pick with Rome. Hoping to forestall just such an outcome, Suetonius issued marching orders to his foot soldiers. Meanwhile, he rode on ahead with his cavalry to Londinium to see what could be done to save the city. Turns out, nothing. He was forced to admit when he realized the size of Boudicca's army. The citizens of Londinium wept and pleaded with the general to save them as dust from Boudicca's approaching force rose on the horizon. But the governor made the hard-headed decision to abandon the city to its fate, saving his cavalry to fight another day. Ignoring their pleas, he rode north to regroup with his infantry. Boudicca captured the future British capital and, true to form, burned it to the ground. Every Roman and collaborator who failed to flee was killed. 
A third Roman settlement, Verulamium, was next to feel the Celtic wrath. Cassius Dio estimates that 70 to 80,000 people died in the destruction of these three towns. Boudicca now turned her sights on the approaching Roman army. When her force met Suetonius's in a clearing along a Roman road some days later, both leaders knew the outcome of the battle would decide the fate of Britain. For Boudicca and her Celts, what hung in the balance was freedom or slavery. For the Romans, glory or humiliation. Cassius Dio attributes the following words to the warrior queen as she addressed her troops moments before the battle. You have learned by experience how different freedom is from slavery. You have come to realize how much better is poverty with no master than wealth with slavery. For what treatment is there of the most shameful or grievous sort that we have not suffered ever since these men made their appearance in Britain? Let us, my countrymen and friends and kinsmen, let us do our duty while we still remember what freedom is that we may leave to our children not only its name, but also its reality. Have no fear of the Romans, but they are superior to us, neither in numbers nor in bravery. Their faces anointed with blue paint, their eyes reflecting the ferocity of their chariot-mounted leader. The Celts shouted a battle cry and charged the waiting Roman legions. Britannic courage clashed that day with Roman discipline. The pitched battle lasted for hours as both armies pressed the attack. But there was a reason Rome had conquered the known world. The Celts covered their flesh with paint, while the Romans covered theirs with iron. Celtic defeat, in hindsight, seems to have been inevitable. Boudicca's army, perhaps due to being made homeless by the Roman pillaging of their lands, had traveled with women and children in tow and the victorious Roman legions slaughtered all in savage retribution for their burned cities. Queen Boudicca, unwilling to be dragged to death through the streets of Rome, as was common for defeated leaders, died shortly after the battle. Tacitus records that she drank poison. Famous among the Celts in her own day, and infamous to the Romans, Boudicca's legend faded with time. With the fall of the empire 400 years later, Roman histories were lost or forgotten in Western Europe. Folk history about the Iceni queen seems to have been passed on for centuries, as a 6th century British monk named Gildas, who supported Rome, penned a description of a treacherous lioness who tortured and butchered the Romans. Let me know in the comments right now what your thoughts are on this complicated woman. Was she noble queen or treacherous lioness, as Gildas the monk said? It wasn't until a thousand years later, upon the rediscovery of Roman histories during the Renaissance, that new life was breathed into the Boudican saga. Britons were stunned to learn that one of their own, and a woman no less, had nearly driven off the Roman invaders. They couldn't agree on the spelling of her name, which still has many versions. Boudica, Boudica, Boadicea, and... Buddug? <laughs> Buddug. You can thank the Welsh for that one. And lastly, the Irish have a take on it. But despite the confusion, Elizabethan scholars were delighted to make comparisons between this legendary defender of British freedom and their own red-haired Queen Elizabeth, who faced down the threat of invasion from the Spanish Armada in 1588. The generation of playwrights following after Shakespeare wrote plays about Boudicca, and she became the heroine of patriotic songs and poems. However, the legend of the warrior queen truly came into its own during the long reign of Queen Victoria, their names sharing an identical meaning, victory. Comparisons between the two queens became inevitable. A monumental statue of the Iceni leader astride her chariot, flanked by her daughters, was commissioned with Victoria's enthusiastic support, and her husband Albert lent his own horses as models. Firstly, we have to face the fact that Boudicca's response to the outrages committed against her was nothing short of ruthless. This is not a story of forgiving and forgetting, as we've seen with others. However, there is much to admire in her life. She was brave at a time when women were seen as weak. She took up the mantle of leadership, uniting the Celtic tribes, despite the seeming hopelessness of her cause. Rather than skulking in the shadows after her torture, overawed and overwhelmed as the Romans had intended, Boudicca dedicated her entire being to what she thought was best for her own people, and she gave her life in a cause bigger than herself. 
And that, my friends, is Boudica. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and do it right now. Give the video a like. It really helps spread the word about the channel. And remember, you can do hard things. Be brave, be strong.